Welcome. My name is Anna Bartosik, and I am presenting this Best Practices webinar direct to archive, Accessibility in Language Teaching and Meeting Students' Needs. Why is accessibility important? How can teachers make sure they are meeting the needs of all their students with respect to accessibility? This is what we will cover in this recorded webinar. I'll talk about why accessibility is important, especially uh, with respect to language teaching. Uh, we'll discuss uh, why accessibility is important and what it means when uh, we are teaching online. We will talk about accessibility in documents. We will also discuss Office 365 and accessibility, PowerPoints and accessibility, as well as converting documents to PDFs. So a little bit about what I've learned and now practice. I, um, I enjoy working online when it's, a, when it's a regular type of work at this moment. This webinar is being recorded during uh, the COVID crisis in Canada. So it's a little bit different, but I've, I'm comfortable working online and working with technology and um, I've uh, put into practice some things that are now very routine for me. Um, about two years ago, I started working as a curriculum designer and it was not in, um, in language teaching, it was in the health sciences field. And I was asked to help uh, the faculty there because it was a private school, become familiar with uh, the AODA Act, Accessibility for Ontarians with um, Disabilities Act. And I realized that there are many things that I have come to just accept as normal practice that might be new for others. And so that's why I thought I would um, share with you the things that, I've, that I take for granted, perhaps, but that others might not realize when, um, when they're developing and designing materials for students and in our context, language learners. So the first question, why uh, is accessibility important? There are many reasons why uh, we should consider accessibility. Um, students in general can have a difficult time processing information for various reasons, whether it is because uh, of auditory processing, uh, perhaps they have difficulty with visual processing, perhaps they have difficulty concentrating um, reading sometimes is a challenge. And in many cases, so, uh, language learners have not been assessed in home countries for processing difficulties for a variety of reasons. Perhaps they were forced to flee their homes. Um, maybe their parents didn't want them to be tested. Maybe there were no supports in schools for them to receive. And so when we're learning a language, and compound that with the barriers to accessibility, the learning process becomes that much harder. So the best thing for us to do as language teachers is to make all materials accessible for all learners to limit the need for accommodations that students may have, whether you teach um, in a school board, at a college, a university, settlement English, private language school, uh, private, um, private students, in any of these contexts, we can make our materials easier for students to use. And at the time of this recording, as I said, learning is taking place only online right now. Um, these are other considerations that uh, additional considerations we must, uh, we must take into account. So let's first discuss um, accessibility when we're teaching online. There are many things to consider. So a few weeks ago before we started teaching online. I teach at a community college in Ontario. We sent out um, a survey to students to find out what access they had to devices. So um, these are the things that are important and that may affect students learning if they are studying online as many students are at the time of the recording. Uh, documents. How do documents open? Do they open as Word documents or as PDFs? Uh, do students have access to devices like laptops, desktops, uh, tablets, iPads, Android phones, iPhones? Maybe they don't have a smartphone. 
uh, the type of device that they have, the brand might even uh, be important, the size of the screen, if you share a Word document with a student, how easy is it to read that on a small screen like a cell phone? Uh, how we share videos and the fact that screen readers are important. Now, throughout this presentation, you'll notice that I have a period after um, every point and after every heading on my slides. That's been a deliberate choice on my part, not uh, because of visual um, beauty or anything like that. But when, um, when students need to use a screen reader, so to have a device read the document to them, the screen reader doesn't pause until there's punctuation. And so uh, if a screen reader were to read the slide to a student, and it's an automated voice, it will pause at the end of every line because I've put a period there. And if you have students who have difficulty and need to use screen readers to help them uh, understand your content, uh, we'll talk about what the best way to present that content in, but um, adding a period to the end of every line is helpful for the screen reader to pause at, piece, at, uh, at punctuation. If there is no punctuation at the end of a line, even though I'm using bullets here and not using many words, the screen reader will continue reading and it sometimes is difficult to process that information without the pauses. Um, I haven't done it consistently throughout this presentation, but also for visual processing, it's good to, uh, to capitalize every letter in a title on a slide, especially if you're presenting it on a screen. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, why that's important. And now I'd like to discuss accessibility in documents and specifically Word documents. So I've taken a screen capture of a Word document and the areas that are highlighted in yellow are the areas that usually need the most focus. Now, as material developers, some of us are really good at it and some of us really enjoy creating a wonderful handout with lots of visuals and images. But if you're teaching online, that handout doesn't translate very well to online learning, for example. And if you share a digital copy with students, even if you're not only teaching online, there are many things that make it difficult for them to process. Another thing to consider is if you share this document on a piece of paper, there are also things you need to consider that make your document easier or more difficult to read. And these are the items that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the types of fonts that we use, the size of fonts, the color of our text and any other colors we use in our documents, uh, the use of headings and uh, formatting documents. Now on my screen right now, there is an image. And if you don't have any visual processing uh, challenges, then you can see that I have a circle. It's the shape of a circle made up of smaller circles. And within the circle, you can probably see the letter W. If you have problems processing this image and you don't see the W, then you might um, have difficulties distinguishing between the colors red and green. And I've used this image specifically because um, we use red for uh, wrong answers and green for correct answers. And I'd like to challenge you all and ask you to consider uh, not to use color to differentiate, but uh, to use maybe words or symbols. So using a check mark or an X instead of the, a red color and a green color to differentiate. And what do I mean by differentiate? Well, if you have a, a number of circles, as we do on the screen, and I ask you to please um, draw a line through the W, the green W. If somebody doesn't see the green, then they can't draw any line. And so the instructions are um, not serving their purpose. So to think about that, how can I change my instructions? I might have to add shapes. I might uh, not use color. 
I'll just say, please select the correct box with the answer, or please um, cross out all the circles that you see in the picture. Um, so the most important thing is not to use color for differentiation because some people can't see the differences between colors. And when we're working in a Word document, so for sharing a Word document, and this is um, for sharing it as a piece of paper or sharing it in digital form, the same uh, rules apply. You should be using a 12 point font or larger so that it's easy to read even when the screen isn't magnified. And the reason for that is if you're using smaller fonts, someone is gonna to have to take their finger maybe on a cell phone and scroll, push the, the movement around or, or make with their fingers um, the document bigger to see. And then it's difficult for them to manage. So a 12 point font is a good font on paper to read. And it's also a suggested standard font. Uh, most, uh, if you have a Microsoft Word on your computer as a process with processing um, software, uh, the default setting is not 12 point. I believe the default setting can be 10 or 11. So you have to change that. Uh, when we're creating documents, we should be using sans serif fonts. That means fonts without tails and little, um, little edges. So the font you see on the screen is the Arial font. It is a sans serif font, a font without any uh, little endings or, or doohickeys, as some people like to call them. Calibri is another uh, sans serif font. I know that some teachers like to use um, Comic Sans because it looks like a cheerful font but it might not always be the easiest one to read on screen. Although for some people who have dyslexia, it might be an easier font to read on paper. If you are creating instructions for students, sometimes we use red colors for words to draw attention to them. But again, if a student has color blindness, they can't see that red. So you're not emphasizing that. Instead, I would suggest that you use uh, a bolding or a sizing feature to draw attention to the text. So if your text is 12 point font, then highlight that font, uh, that word, I'm sorry, and make it larger, make it 14 or size 16, and then bold it. Try to avoid underlining and italics because that is difficult for people with visual processing to read. It really, um, it doesn't remain stable on the page. It's difficult to explain without having the, the condition. Um, in digital documents, it's very important to use headings so that when a student is using a screen reader, the screen reader can let them know that this is a new topic that we're, we're starting. And you should be using formatting features on your document whenever possible. What does that mean? You should be not using the space bar to make spaces in your document. You should use the tab key. Uh, you should not be hitting enter 14 times to get to a new page. You should use some um, shortcuts. So if you hold down the control on, a, let's say I'm using a Lenovo right now, if you use the control key and hold it down and then hit enter, it will create a page break for you. And if you're on a MacBook, you would hold down the command key and hit enter to start a new page. And that is helpful for people who are using screen readers because if you include the spaces or if you include all those 16 returns to get to a new page, the screen reader will read that to a student. And can you imagine how um, frustrating that must be? Um, for PowerPoints, uh, right now during the, this COVID crisis, but uh, at any time, PowerPoints are very popular documents for presentations. And some of us are using them a lot to deliver lessons online, combined with video like I'm doing right now. Uh, if you're presenting uh, in a large room, size 28 font is ideal, the smallest size you should be using for presentations in a room. Uh, on this screen, I believe um, the headings are a little larger but the, the points that I have on both sides are using size 28 point font to make it easy to read. As uh, with Word documents using bolding and sizing, 
is um, important to draw attention to text. And um, I'll just show, I'm just gonna go back in my presentation to show you what I mean by avoiding animations. So a lot of us like to um, have the title on our slide and then bring in a new line one by one to uh, add and show up in our presentations because it, it looks interesting. We want to draw people's attention. But again, screen readers have a difficult time reading this. So um, it also might be visually challenging to see something like that in a room with difficult lighting. So what I would suggest is you would take this page and copy it for as many items as you need. So you see on the next slide, I have one, two, three, four, five, six items. And maybe you want to click your, um, your clicker in the classroom and move to the next animation. How you can avoid that is to take this, this um, slide, copy it six times, so you'll have seven copies in total, and then just add one line to the second slide. Then you have two lines on the third slide. So you would have more slides in your presentation, but it would still have the effect that you wanted it to have in a, uh, in a classroom as uh, words uh, coming in. And students will not notice this in a presentation, face-to-face uh, -face presentation, and anyone who's using a screen reader for whatever, need they, whatever needs they have uh, would not uh, have to deal with the, the challenge of having these animations be described um, to them as they're trying to read your document. The other reason not to use animations is that on a slide, what you see here is the final product. But I worked on the slide and I made changes. If I added animations and text boxes, um, the screen reader will read everything to a student, but it will read everything in the order that it was created. And it's not, uh, it doesn't appear in um, numbers. So that's what I meant by uh, avoiding animations. Another thing to consider is, just like with Word documents, to use headings for your slides to indicate a topic and a topic has changed. Uh, if you want to continue with the same topic, so if I, um, you'll notice that I've done it here, I've used the same heading for three slides, accessibility and documents, and that is a, a heading. You will see it again on this page and see it again on this page. And it changes here, so um, the slide doesn't have a heading. If I were to download this as a PDF and share it with someone, the best thing for me to do would be to uh, add a heading here so that students would know what this, uh, this uh, image relates to. And I'll talk about images a little later on. And as I mentioned with Word documents, use formatting features whenever possible. So um, a lot of us, when we're using PowerPoints, we like to save some time. And uh, we want to uh, take a screen picture or take a photo of some words and copy them into our presentation. And it looks great on the slide, but again, those screen readers, they don't see the words in an image. It just appears as a blank box. And so you're not sharing content with the students who might need to know that content. So if you have a wonderful table in a book or um, you have a picture of it, uh, it won't look as beautiful as the picture, but you should use the formatting features within the presentation. Let me just step out of here so you can see. Um, so if we, if we clicked on insert, there's my table feature. I would use that to create a table instead of um, copying a picture of a table and, um, and pasting it into my slides. Okay, I'm gonna move on now. Um, now, Office 365 is um, 
a, a good feature to have. A lot of us work in schools, um, schools, whether they are universities, colleges, school boards, um, and perhaps even settlement, um, settlement language programs. Uh, we, they have access to Office 365 accounts, and you might not even know that you have access to it. Uh, but there are a lot of wonderful features that Office 365 has and how it's a little bit different, the, the way it looks. So, um, for example, if you take a look at my presentation right now, it looks similar to PowerPoint, Microsoft Word, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, but I'm presenting from the cloud, from Office 365. I'm not presenting from a PowerPoint. Um, my PowerPoint um, is open down here. I do have a PowerPoint there and it has one of the same images, but I'm not presenting from that. I'm presenting from uh, a cl the, the cloud. So Office 365 is very similar to your standard Office platform on your computer, but you can save everything in the cloud, like with uh, Google Docs, for example. And you have the same functionality as Google Drive. So anything you work on in the cloud and documents you work on in the Office suite are synced across your devices. Um, what does that mean, synced? So if I, if I work on my, this PowerPoint that I'm presenting to you on my um, laptop, I can then take, let's see if I can reach over. I can then open my, um, my iPad and open up OneDrive and find it there as well. It's saving across devices. Um, when you get used to using the functionalities of Office 365, it will also allow you to work on documents offline. Um, another wonderful thing is that you can, just like with Google Docs, you can share a link to, um, to your Word document in Office 365 with another person. It could be outside your organization. If it's outside your organization, they'll have a limited uh, amount of time to access that document before it becomes unavailable or just within your institution. So they would log in with their, um, their institution credentials. Um, you do not need to download Office 365 to work on documents, but you can. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I won't talk about how you can do that, but you can collaborate with people in uh, real time. And uh, another benefit to having um, Office 365 and OneDrive is that you have a terabyte of storage available on your account. Um, that could be 300 movies, uh, high definition movies. Uh, I don't think any of us need all of that space but with uh, an Office 365 account, you have that access. And so you can save a lot of things, movies, sound clips, and things like that, and share them with your students. Um, why am I talking about Office 365 during a recorded webinar on accessibility? Well, checking for accessibility in Office 365 is more streamlined than in Microsoft Word products off your computer. Um, and we're going to talk about um, how we can deal with images. And I'll show you both types of ways we can deal with images in both products to see how you can, um, how you can use, uh, how you can describe images to students and how much easier it is in one product versus the other. But in order to um, try out um, Office 365, in your browser window, so if you're using um, if you're using Chrome or you're using Microsoft Edge or Firefox or Safari, whatever um, browser you like to use, in the search bar across the top, you need to type in HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash P O R T A L dot office dot com. And if you get the, the, the complete uh, address wrong, you can just type in portal office, those two words, into your browser search bar and hit enter and you'll be able to access the, um, the login. Uh, you will use your email and password. So uh, if you belong to an institution, use your institution's email 
and password to log in. And the Office 365 product will take you through a short orientation to set up your page. And once you're done, it will look something like this image that you see. So um, over here, we have Microsoft Outlook, the email. OneDrive where we can find everything. So if you're used to using uh, Google, this is like your G Drive where everything is. This is Office Word, Office Excel, PowerPoint, which is what I'm using today. There's some other interesting um, uh, apps here like uh, SharePoint, Teams, Class Notebook for OneNote, uh, Sway. There's also uh, Microsoft Forms. So a lot of the features that you might be familiar with from Google and G Drive and the Google Suite are available for you here. And then you can personalize it. So I've, um, because I'm a, both a student at one institution and an employee at another, so I have two of these accounts, I've personalized them so that I can see the difference between them when I arrive on the main page. Uh, this is the one that I have for uh, my, as a student and as an employee, my, um, my theme I, that I use is Lego, just so I know that where I am. Am I using my school account or my student account? Uh, now, you can also use Office 365 on your device. Um, and it is possible to install Office 365 on a computer and other devices. And with an Office 365 account, I believe you're given five uh, downloads onto different devices, different laptops. So there could be people in your family that could use uh, an account. But I won't be talking about that, about how to do that today. But if you're using your browser, like I am today, on your laptop or desktop at home, you don't need to install Office 365. You can just use it in Google, in Microsoft Edge, in Firefox, and Safari. Okay? Um, and if you want to download a document, you can do that. And I'll show you how we can do that a little bit later on. If you want to collaborate with your colleagues, you can share a link to one of those Word or Excel or PowerPoints with other users via email, and you can collaborate with people either synchronously or asynchronously. So there's no need for you to save on a hard drive and save different versions or share different versions of documents because they're all there in your version history and no need to, oh, am I using the, the latest version? You're always using the, the latest and the newest version of your documents. So I'll ask you to try um, this. You can pause the, um, the recording and open up a new tab or open a new browser window, whether you use Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Firefox, or Safari, go to https colon forward slash forward slash P-O-R-T-A-L dot O-F-F-I-C-E dot C-O-M. Enter your workplace ID or email and password if you are using Microsoft Office tools, and then you'll add your password. And then you come back to listen to me talk a little bit longer. So now I come to the point about PowerPoints and accessibility, and we'll be discussing images in this section of this recording. And I've taken a screenshot of not Office 365, but the regular PowerPoint. I believe the version I have at home is Office 2013. So it's about seven years old. And you can see here that I, th these are the usual features that people are using in PowerPoint. And um, I'm going to step out of this presentation for a second before I come to these instructions. And I'm going to start a new share with you. I want to share with you the PowerPoint document that I have on my computer. Okay, so here we are. And I have this image, you, you recognize this image from, the, um, from earlier on in the presentation. Now, 
if I'm going to share my PowerPoint with students, and I know my students have visual processing issues, uh, I need to offer them descriptions of any image that I use so that they have access to all the materials that I'm working with. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to take this image and I'm going to put my mouse over it. You can see the mouse hovering over it and I'm going to right click over the image. Try that again. Okay, and when I right click on the image, this information appears. Okay, uh, there, that can happen or let me go back and share my other screen. The other thing that might happen, depending on which version of Microsoft Office you have, is that you won't get that popping up on your screen. You'll get something that will say format you'll get this. When you right click on an image, all these things will come up. And then what you want to do is click um, format shape. Okay, the very last item there. And when you click on format shape, oh, when you click on format shape, um, you'll have um, this appear as I told you, and you're not going to click the, um, the paint can, and you're not going to click the Pentagon. You're going to click this. Okay, you see how it is, there's a little divot here on the screen. You're going to click on this, and then you will click Alt Text. And the Alt Text feature allows you to describe the image so that the student or the individual who's using your um, PowerPoint knows what is in that picture. They need to know exactly what the other learners need uh, know when they see it. And at this point, this is where I think a lot of teachers will say, well, how, how much do I describe the image? What do I, what, what words do I use? Do I have to describe it really, really well? Um, well, there are a few things that uh, you should consider doing. Okay, um, you need to then click on the alt text and the recommendation here by the, by the Microsoft Office program is to give the object uh, one to two sentences of a description. So if you go back to that image, it is a round shape with many circles that are red and green and uh, the letter W can be seen in the middle. That would be a, a good description of that image that I used. Um, now, depending on what version of Microsoft Office you have, it might offer you number two to generate a description for you, or number three to mark the um, object as decorative. So if you consider this presentation today, and if we go back, and I share with you that PowerPoint that I shared with you. This image was important to my presentation because I was using it to illustrate a point. So I would have to describe this image for everyone to benefit from it, uh, anyone who reads uh, and looks at my PowerPoint. Um, but sometimes, uh, in the classroom, you use a cartoon to make a joke, to keep people's attention. And in those cases, perhaps the image is not uh, that important. Uh, and that is why And that is why you would mark it as decorative. You could check this off and then you wouldn't have to describe it because of course, 
what the students uh, the students don't need to have the joke in order to understand the content if they're reading it uh, on their own. So that's what Marka's decorative does. And we're going to talk about generating descriptions and the challenges with that. Okay, so there I show you, you can mark a, uh, an object as decorative and then you don't have to describe it and then you won't be able to enter any information here and nothing will appear here either. Again, this depends what version of Microsoft Office you're using. Uh, the version I have on my computer, Microsoft Office 2013, I believe, or 15, um, does not generate a description for me. I have to click uh, the image for um, format image or format shape. Um, other versions are a little bit different. So uh, one of the things that I've learned by helping teachers is you have to know what version you have on your computer. Um, versions as far back as 2003 do have accessibility features. But if uh, some of you are still using, I don't know why, but if you're still using the Microsoft Office um, 1996 or Windows 1998, those versions do not have accessibility features. And uh, in your case, since you're looking at a product that's over 22 years old, I'd suggest try out Office 365. You won't have to pay for it if your institution um, has, uh, using, is using Outlook and Office. It most likely has accounts for OneDrive. And so we've talked about um, converting images. Uh, sorry, not converting images, um, describing images and the importance of that, uh, how it might look on different versions of Microsoft Office PowerPoint or Word. Um, we've talked about colors and formatting documents and fonts. And now I'd like to talk about converting documents to PDFs. And I'll talk about uh, the automatic generation of picture descriptions at the very end. Okay, I promise I won't forget. So when, uh, when we share documents with students, especially this is important in digital environments, um, you should always offer your students two versions of your document. You should offer, if you're creating a Word document, you should post a Word document and you should post a PDF of that Word document. And the reason why, again, is the screen reader. The screen reader will do a better job of reading all the information from a PDF than it will from a Word document. The student will have to convert uh, that Word document. So in some places, Kurzweil is the screen reader that some schools have installed on their computers. What a student has to do in order to use your Word document on a computer, they have to have it saved somewhere on a, on a USB, on one of these, or be able to open it from a remote place on the computer at the school or on their personal computers, then they have to open that document, they have to save it as a PDF, and then they have to upload that document into the screen reader so that the screen reader will read it for them. And so I'd like you to consider how much effort that is for a student every time. And it's not a huge effort for us to save it uh, in two different formats and provide students with both. So students who want to work from a Word document can work from a Word document, and students who want to work from a PDF can work from a PDF. There's, it's, it's a minimal effort on our part if we know how to do it, but it is um, a huge burden for students, or can be. So I tried to do this um, for meetings every time for one week. I decided to use my iPad and convert all the minutes of meetings and um, schedules and things like that, anything I needed for a meeting for a week, I would convert to a uh, PDF so that I could take notes on it. So I wasn't using any paper for a whole week, just to see how, how much work this would be. It was an extra 10 minutes before every meeting for me to make these changes. So if a student has five classes and each class the teacher posts 10 documents that's um 
five times 10, that's 50 times 10 minutes. That is a lot of time out of somebody's week to just be uh, converting documents. It's easier for us to do it. So having said that, once we have a PowerPoint and we want to save it, don't click save. Uh, well, click save, but before you close your document, click save as. And here we'll show you when you click save as, and I have a gray theme on my Word uh, Office um, theme, I guess you would call it. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I preferred it gray because it was easier on my eyes. You might have a white screen, okay? And when you click save as, you'd come over here to this little downwards facing triangle and click there and select uh, moving from a PowerPoint to PDF, right? You would select PDF, okay? And now the PowerPoint will be converted to a PDF, but we want to make sure our accessibility features have transferred over because I spent a lot of time adding descriptions to my images and I might actually have speaker's notes in my PowerPoint. So if you're teaching online, and as we all are at this moment when I'm recording this, you're creating little videos for students, maybe you want them to also see the words that are on your screen. And I know that um, there is a way that you can make the slide presentation show up with automatic captions. I didn't do that for today's presentation because it would cover up my screen. You can do that, but if you don't do that and you're not comfortable with it, that's okay. We can save your speaker's notes that you want to share with students in your PDF. So you'll click PDF, save, no, not save. You'll click on more options the first time. And you'll be prompted and it will say, would you like to convert this presentation's speaker's notes to text annotations in the PDF. And the annotations will be created on a separate layer that can be tagged on, okay? And so you'll also have speaker's notes and they disappear in, if you convert to a PDF unless you change how somebody views their slides. So you want to just select slides and notes to appear and then you'll be prompted with this message. So uh, please make sure that you're giving your students all the opportunities that you're giving uh, sighted students to, um, to be successful. Now, in Office 365, it's much easier to convert to a PDF. Oh, let me show you. I'm going to step out here, out of the presentation, and uh, you can see the screen now as it appears for me in my browser. So I have this document, I'm working in Office 365, I'm using PowerPoint in Office 365. I want to um, save it as a, um, a PDF. How do I do that? It's very simple. We click on File, and we're going to click Download As, not save a copy, because remember, we're in the cloud, so we can save everything. We're going to download a copy, and now I have options. I can download a copy onto my computer as a PowerPoint, or I can download as a PDF. So I'm going to click that, download as a PDF. It tells me that my presentation is ready. And now it's gonna prompt me uh, where I want to save everything. So I'm gonna click cancel because I don't need a copy. But, and it's quite simple, uh, a little bit easier than uh, making all those conversions in Office, um, in Microsoft Office from your computer. So that was Office 365 and converting to PDFs. So um, a few things about images and alt text. We can be, um, we can be tempted to just have the computer generate the description for me. So if you remember, I suggested to you that a good description of this image would be to say that this is a, of a series of circles arranged in a circle. So within a circle, we have a series of circles, both red and green circles of various sizes, 
with the letter W in the middle. Let's see what Office 365 does for us when we want to describe this image. So I'm going to right click. Another thing I want to do is sometimes if you don't know what you want to do, you would click on alt text here and just type in in the search bar where the uh, light bulb is and uh, you can click on that to or type in alt text and it will you won't have to remember where the command is you can just find it this way okay and so it has generated a description for me and if you can see it says this is a picture containing honeycomb food and a flower and it says that this description was generated with a very high confidence. This is not, this does not match this description. So um, generating descriptions for us, we have to be careful um, and perhaps turn, use it without, with, with some judgment that um, we don't always get the best description to let AI describe uh, things for us. So please keep that in mind that uh, it may take you a little bit more time to make those conversions uh, by adding your own descriptions, but um, they are valuable. Uh, this brings us to the end of this session. I'd like to thank you for being concerned about your learners and thinking about how you can make learning for them easier, whether it's online or face-to-face. I hope you found some things that are useful for you or learned some things that you didn't know. And I hope that you can uh, go back to teaching the next time that you teach, take a look at your materials and ask yourself, can I do better? Can I make these materials more accessible so that more of my students can use my materials and have fewer problems using them? Thank you very much. <laughs>